Mom's dad's group, dad was Bayless Ritchie, and mom was Abigail Hall Ritchie. And there was May, Ollie, Mally, Uni, Raymond, Kitty, Truman, Patty, Edna, Jewel, Opal, Pauline, Wilmer, and Jean. My very first memory is of our house, filled with crowds and noise and laughing and singing and crying. Beds, chairs, everything full and running over with people. Mom would sometimes say out loud in a sort of wonder, Lordy, it's a mystery to me that the house don't fly all to pieces. Dad said, uh, you ever hear this one? And he started humming, dum deedle dee deedle dum deedle doo dum dum shady grove, shady grove. He was trying to get it together, you know. And I said, no, I never heard that, anything about shady grove. So then he stood there for a few minutes and thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he hummed, and he stomped his feet, and he finally got the song out. There was always somebody sort of special that came to those things. You, you always met somebody new at, at, the, uh, at the dances and at the parties. And, and, and so that night, uh, a man came whose name was John Henry Falk. And he was a humorist. He told funny stories in, in a, a sort of a Texas accent, you know. And, and um, he was a writer and was a well-known person. He, heard me sing and he said well you know who you ought to meet you ought to meet Alan Lomax and I said boy I've heard of him all my life I'd like to meet him so um I did I went up there that and he had a um an office or you know a little crowded office in Decca and, and he stayed after work so I could come in and see him and as soon as I sang a song or two he said I want to record everything you you know <laughs> I said well Mr. Lomax, that'll take me a long time because the family has a three, three, about 300 songs at least. I've been trying to count them up, you know. And he said, well, I don't care. I want to have a lot of sessions and, and record everything. And so we, we did. We started having recording sessions and uh, recording all the ballads and things that I knew. And he did send them off to the Library of Cong Congress archives. asked me to come and, and sing on that concert, and that was a much more big time thing than, than the Little Greenwich Muse Theater. Just before the concert started, we were all back there being nervous. The door opens, and we were all standing back there and sort of huddled up, waiting to, to begin, and this little, small little, wiry little man with hair standing way up on his head and little curls on top. And he jumped into the room, and he started leaping around to all the microphones and blowing into them. <laughs> <laughs> and we <laughs> I said, who's that crazy man? And Alan laughed, and he said, that's Woody Guthrie. So uh, then he brought him around and introduced us, him to all of us. And Woody wasn't playing that night, but he had just come to um, aggravate us backstage, he said. <laughs> I was on some early television programs with my friend Pete Seeger. Oh, I guess it was in the late 40s. And seemed like at the time he was going to help bring folk music to this whole new electronic audience. But uh, because of his left-wing political views, Pete was soon to be blacklisted. He wouldn't appear on television again for almost 20 years. I was born and raised in East Virginia. Well, through Pete Seeger, I got invited to the 1959 uh, Newport Folk Festival. I guess that was the first one, and it was a commercial festival that year. And I went, and uh, Frank Warner was there, and uh, Pete Seeger, and um, a lot of other people. Newport was like the event in folk music. And there was a glamour about it. I mean, the biggest names in folk music were there. Peter, Paul, and Mary were going to be there that year. And they were, I mean, they were already big stars. 
Joan Baez was there. Then we went through the the, the time when Bob Dylan went electric and uh, Pete Seeger was looking around for a rock backstage to throw through the, the blasted machine, <laughs> the electric machine. <laughs> In the middle of all this hoopla sat this warm, um, dignified, self-possessed Gene Ritchie played on the dulcimer and sang some old song that I'd never heard before, but part of my genes had heard that song. You knew that she was singing that song exactly the way she would have sung it for you uh, in her living room or in Kentucky when she was growing up. Arlo Guthrie had just finished singing, telling the story of Alice's Restaurant. Got an absolute ovation. I was the MC, and <laughs> poor Jean. I pushed her on the stage, you have to follow him. There she was at the mic, facing this crowd that wanted to hear more of Arlo. And she started out unaccompanied, singing Amazing Grace. This fantastic, fantastic melody. After the audience heard Amazing Grace, they were, you could hear a pin drop. 10,000 of people, whatever it was there, had quieted down completely and were drawn into this amazing song. Of course, I've been singing Amazing Grace ever since that night, too. I, you know, you see somebody like that, what's in the barest simplicity, go out, and all of a sudden, the power of the songs and the power of the performer and the years that you, you and the wisdom that you bring to that moment uh, opened my eyes, you know. I met this man called Jack Holzman, um, who was a, about a 17 or 18 year old boy, very callow youth, we used to call him. <laughs> he wanted to start a record company. And he, went, he called it Electra, E-L-E-K-T-R-A. It got to be a very, very big company. And, um, um, but I was his first record. I did um, albums for years for Folkways and for um, one for Warner Brothers. I did the first album for Electra, and I did the first folk album for Sire. Um, and they went on to be uh, be punk and, and every other possible modern thing after that, but they started out with my album. I come from the mountains, Kentucky's my home. Well, I began to write songs. Um, the very first song I ever wrote was a lullaby, and because that was when my boys were little. But then uh, later on, things began to happen in, in the mountains where I'm from, uh, Viper and Hazard and the coal fields down there. Things began to happen that had no songs. They were too new, like strip mining and things like that. Then came the Ellen and Don't Stop Here Anymore about our little train, and Blue Diamond Mines about mine safety underground. I had two brothers that worked in the mines, and so we were very much conscious of that, of being worried about them when they were underground. I did those songs all about the same time, and then I didn't do any more for three or four years. I put a pseudonym on them because I, for two reasons, I didn't want, one, I didn't want my mother bothered by people who, who said, your daughter's out there doing protest songs, and she must be a communist. I mean, people were saying things like that then, you know, so. I just uh, put my grandfather's name on. I wanted to have John Hall, which was his name, but um, the president of BMI at the time was named John Hall, so I, <laughs> they, wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me have his name, so I, I took the end of the name, Than Hall, just for the protest songs. So I'd done all those albums and uh, had never used anything electric or um, hadn't really produced the album very much. It was all, they were all definitely folk albums. And George had the idea that, uh, well, maybe we can do an album that will get played on AM re re uh, stations as well as FM stations. We finally decided to go ahead and do a, a more highly produced album anyway and, and see if they would, uh, if the, the stations would play it. it I thought it sounded nice. I, I, I said, well, it was very tasteful if it was electric. I guess uh, George's idea was right. He said, out of a few modern conveniences, to the music and AM radio will play it and that's what happened. 
None but one, much to my surprise, was named Best Folk Album of the Year in 1977 by Rolling Stone magazine. Well, Gene Ritchie, like the rest of us, uh, will someday uh, pass in history, but uh, she'll, she'll be here. Her music will, will live. I've been performing now for 50 years, I guess. It's a good round figure. My new album is number 40-something, and all my singing life, I've not fit into any categories. I've been too folk to be considered anything else, and too, I guess you'd say, musically aware to be considered a folk. A, wo a woman once introduced me by saying I couldn't be a real folk singer because I'd been to college. 